Hello photographers, Mike Wardinsky here, and today we're going to talk about some of the most common mistakes that people make when using Lightroom Classic, and how you can avoid making those same mistakes. But before we get started, don't forget to check out naturemike.com for some great how-to articles and reviews, private post-processing lessons, and in-field workshops. Without further ado, let's get started. The absolute biggest mistake that people make when using Lightroom is not knowing where their catalog is located or where their photos are going. If you don't know where your photos are stored, there's a really good chance that you're going to lose them somewhere along the way. If you're new to Lightroom or if you think you might have a bit of a mess or Lightroom just kind of confuses you, go ahead and click on the link in the upper right hand corner. I've got a really great video on how I set up my Lightroom catalog and that video will give you a great foundation and hopefully prevent you from losing your photos going forward. The second biggest mistake that people make when using Lightroom actually happens outside of Lightroom itself. You never want to move photos on your computer's hard drive using the Finder or Explorer. So I've got a folder here full of photos. If I were to take this folder and move it, say, somewhere else on my hard drive, Lightroom is no longer going to know where those photos are. So if I come back to Lightroom and click here, you can notice my folder has a big question mark here. Lightroom doesn't know where it is. And you also see all these exclamation points, meaning these photos are now offline. And so there's no way for us to really process these or export these out of Lightroom because Lightroom doesn't know where they are. Now, reconnecting these photos can be a bit difficult, and I do have a, another great video on how to do that. I'm not going to dive into that right now, but the biggest takeaway is never move photos or folders on your hard drive. Always do it within Lightroom. So I'm going to go back to my Finder, and I'm going to undo that move. And these should update if I go into the Develop module here. This photo is now back online. And sometimes it can take a moment for these exclamation points to go away. You might have to restart Lightroom to see them clear out. So the proper way to move a folder would be to simply just grab it right here, and then we could move that over to 2022. And now you can see actually my exclamation points went away, everything is connected, and we're still good. And if I come over to my Finder, you can see my folder has now been moved on my hard drive as well. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the fun stuff. Let's head over, head over to the Develop module, and we're going to talk about some of the mistakes that people make while editing. First and foremost, you want to avoid an over-reliance on auto settings and presets. It can be very tempting just to come over here to the auto and hit that and say, okay, my, my photo's done. And so that you can see it moved my sliders for me. And if you are going to use auto settings, I do recommend continuing to tweak the photo because in my opinion, we could push this much further and come up with a better image. So don't over rely on the auto. If you're going to use it, don't be afraid to come over here and make some adjustments afterwards. The other thing you want to avoid is an over-reliance on presets. They can be very tempting because you can get a lot of different looks very quickly just by hovering over these different presets. But if you begin to rely on presets too much, you're not going to develop your own processing style and you're going to be reliant on presets that somebody else has built for you. They're okay to use once in a while, just don't become reliant on them. Moving along, some of the biggest editing mistakes I see is being too heavy-handed on the dehaze and or the clarity slider. When used correctly, these sliders can add a really nice touch to a photo, but you don't want to overdo it. You don't want the photo looking crunchy. It can be tempting, especially with the dehaze, to push this really hard. We get all these really nice blues starting to come out of the sky and the nice green in the water, but it gets a little bit crunchy. So if you wanted to add that contrast or that saturation, you might want to think about doing it more locally rather than using it globally because our rocks are getting really crunchy and these two sliders when used together can really create sort of like a digital clunky looking image. And if you're just new to processing, you're probably going to be tempted to push these pretty hard. Um, but typically you want to stay back a little bit on the lower side, usually somewhere between 10 and 20. Now each image is different. There may be some images that you want to push it a little bit harder, and there may be some where you don't want to touch these sliders hardly at all. It all depends on the tonality of the image. But just be careful not to push them too hard, otherwise your photos are going to look fake or very digital. It's important to be aware of the difference between 
tonal adjustments such as those found in the basic and tone curve and color adjustments such as those found in the HSL color tab. Tonal adjustments are always smoother than color adjustments. So more often than not, you don't want to be too heavy handed with these HSL color adjustments. So if I were to go to my blue channel, I got some nice blue in the sky and take the luminance down. Let's zoom in here and you'll notice there's all these blotches in the sky. And again, that's because it's a color adjustment, not a tonal adjustment. So typically you don't want to push these all the way to the end. You want to be a little more conservative with any sort of hue saturation or luminance adjustment. Let's look at another example here. So again, it can be very tempting to want to darken the sky just by taking the blue luminance down. So if we zoom in, you can see we get this sort of hideous halo here. And halos are my, my biggest pet peeve when it comes to photographs. And we'll also notice that in the sky, we have a lot of blotching as well. And so to get rid of that, we're just going to bring that slider back. And you can see all the, the blotching went away and the halo is pretty much gone as well. When you have a colorful image like this one, it can be tempting to make the colors pop. And that's not a bad idea. You just need to know when to stop. It can be very tempting to come to the hues or vibrant slider and really push these really heavily. And you can see this looks absolutely ridiculous. The water's extremely blue and the colors just look very fake. So if you're gonna add saturation or vibrance, make sure you do it very minimally or even better yet, you can come down to the color slider and do it selectively by using the saturation sliders of the reds or oranges, whatever colors you have in your photo, and it'll look a little more natural oftentimes. Tonality is one of the things that makes an image interesting to look at. It's what gives us contrast. So here we have this nice light sky and these nice dark rocks. Now the bottom is a little bit darker than maybe what I would like, so we could bump that up a little bit, but you need to be careful not just to come to the shadow slider and crank it all the way and call that done. Because now we have a very flat image. Sure, we can see the detail in the rocks, but just because it's there doesn't mean we need to include it. So we can always back this down a little bit, maybe somewhere like that, where we get a little more detail in the rocks, but it's not completely dark. Now there are ways where you can add a little more shadow detail and then balance that out by bringing the whites up and the blacks down. And you can kind of balance the highlights and shadows with the whites and blacks. And this takes just a little bit of kind of messing around and playing around with the sliders to kind of see what the, the right amount is. Each photo will be different because each photo will be a different tonality. But the, again, the last thing you want is your photo to look like this where it's just very flat and not a lot of contrast. Unless you're shooting in a low contrast environment such as, you know, uh, maybe a, like a foggy scene or maybe a snowstorm, something like that where there wouldn't naturally be a lot of contrast already. Lastly, you should always make sure that you're removing chromatic aberrations, which can be found under the lens corrections tab. Now, if you're not familiar with what chromatic aberrations are, if I zoom in here, you'll notice this little bit of a turquoise band here. I'm not sure how easy that's going to be to see in the video, but just simply by checking remove chromatic aberration, it goes away. And I'll uncheck that and hopefully you can kind of see the difference. Take a look right here. And when I check it, it's now gone. So it's as simple as that, just coming down to lens corrections and checking remove chromatic aberrations. You can even set up a preset so it happens automatically right over here. And I do have a video on how to do that. And Lightroom now has a lens corrections preset built in as well. So there's a lot of great options. So this happens automatically right at import. But don't forget to do that. There's nothing worse than seeing a printed photo with a blue or magenta banding on an edge because it's as simple as checking a box. Thanks for tuning in everybody. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know if you have any questions down below. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe so I can continue to make these videos for you. And don't forget to check out naturemike.com for some great how-to articles, in-field workshops, and private lessons. See you in the next video.